Welcome to episode three of The Disgusting. If you're new here, thanks for watching. And uh, the premise of this series is that I'm a complete amateur. I've not done any of this stuff before. And I am going to try and see if I can build a drift car for cheap. So my beloved 1996 Mustang is uh, gonna go to the track on May 16th. I'm filming this on May 1st. Uh, I still need to graduate college this week, so uh, that's a whole nother thing. And then I'm starting a full-time job immediately. So this is going to be a rush, but if I've learned anything the past four years, I will not do shit unless I have a deadline. So uh, here we go. What we're doing today is making the Mustang meet the safety specifications of Drift Indy, which is the league that I'm going to be drifting in. So the three big things that I got to do today is install a heat shield because I have an exhaust manifold on the same side as the brake master. I also need to install a fire extinguisher for virtually no reason because I could never see anything going wrong with the Mustang. And then another thing that's probably just gonna end up being tedious is installing toe straps properly into the Mustang. There are a few loyal fans of this series, but ultimately these videos get a fraction of the attention that my reviews do. So if you like this video and the concept, make sure to subscribe. You can also follow me on Instagram right here. Okay, let's get the easy stuff out of the way first. Remove any floor mats or loose bits in the interior that could get in the way. Spend about $200 on a Snell 2020 rated helmet. And then next we are going to install the fire extinguisher. You want to put this in a place that you can grab uh, while your belt is still on. So for me, since my interior is still intact at the moment, uh, I'm going to put this beneath my legs and mount it on the seat. I got a bracketeer and a quick release bracket that I think cost me about 70 or $80 combined, uh, and then throw in another 20 to 30 bucks for a fire extinguisher. So depending on how you want to mount this, this is probably going to cost you between 75 and $100. The first thing that you need to do is take off the seat. Now the factory bolt here for the Mustang is a 15 millimeter. Now, luckily for me, I already went through the hell of trying to remove these bolts that have been on here for 25 years. So uh, this shouldn't be that difficult. However, if your car uh, has been sitting for a while, penetrating fluid might help, but be careful. These, mine just snapped. You only have to remove the front two nuts, or in my case, nut and bolt. Once you have those out, you should install the arms of the bracket. However, just as I was anticipating, Chris Fix had the same issue. The bolts don't actually fit in these bracketeer mounts because these are universal. Um, so we're going to have to shave down. In this case, I have an, a different bolt entirely here. Um, so I'm gonna just see if I can get a different washer to put on here. And then uh, for this one, I'm going to actually need to shave down the nut itself and the washer. After failing to find a new washer, I just grinded down that one and then the other nut and washer combo until they fit. To then find out that the socket wouldn't fit around my bolt unless I chopped off an end, to which my dad just cut it off. You really shouldn't have to do this. I bolted in the arms to the bracket and proceeded. <laughs> Then you will attach the little cross member, hand tighten the two Allen bolts, then tighten them with an Allen wrench. Now you have to install the arms that hold the actual fire extinguisher bracket. I tighten them in the wrong place at first. Pro tip, don't put your weight on these when loosening them. While loose, attach the bracket, then tighten them. Once you have followed through with that, plop your extinguisher on there and call it a day. Feels uh, like a fire extinguisher. I guess this was a success. Now with round one behind us and a operating fire extinguisher properly mounted, now we have to install a heat shield to prevent it from boiling. So then I still have brakes whenever this thing gets hot. The best way to do this is to take a piece of cardboard, uh, slide it in there, and then uh, mark it up in a way that looks correct um, and gives you access to all the necessary things so that it can fit in there still. Um, and then once you get this looking correct, then you take your aluminum sheet metal 
and make the final product. So that's what we're gonna do now. Now, my car had a strut tower brace, so I went ahead and took so I went ahead and took that off it. And that had a little bit too many bolts. And lucky me, I didn't have to chop any of them off. So with this momentum going, uh, let's install this. So again, the purpose of this heat shield is to protect the brake master cylinder reservoir from the heat of the exhaust manifold. For this bit, you're going to need an aluminum sheet, some insulating tape to both insulate and prevent rattles, and some zip ties. We want this shield to protect the master cylinder, so it needs to extend below it a few inches. Once you've made the necessary cuts on your cardboard for fitment and access to the reservoir on the master cylinder, you need to cut the real thing. At first, I tried to use a cut-off saw with a weird power switch, no safety, and it was on when I plugged it in. That's a little dangerous. Well, fuck. Tin snips do the job fine. You just might want to watch for some sharp edges. Consider taping them up. I'd also wear gloves while doing this. Once it was out, I marked out where I needed some bends, secured the sheet to a piece of plywood, and made the bends. I used a roof rail crossbar to help make the bend along with a mallet to make it more sharp. I then realized I had my sheet upside down, so I flipped it over and bent it the other way with some anger. I'm gonna drill a hole right here so I can zip tie it to this. Um, and then I'm uh, also going to create another little bend to assist this around the brake booster. That way I can add a bolt so it will be even more secure and hopefully it doesn't rattle too much. I ended up needing this second bend. However, I couldn't drill in the same place Chris Fix did due to some stuff being in the way. After 40 minutes of trying to make this work, I gave up and just ended up drilling in places I could zip tie it to and then I covered the whole underside in sticky insulation tape. The result passed our tech inspection and held up after track use. Now we're gonna move on to uh, installing the toe strap. Okay, so in order to do this one right, we need to take off the front bumper. I got a tool that's supposed to easily pull off the clips, uh, which is right here and here, and they're supposed to have screws in them, but they don't, which makes my life all a bit more easier. Oh shit. So other people on YouTube had screws here. I had these rivet looking button things that were too beefy for my tool. It took a while for us to find a trim popping tool that was adequate and we ended up actually having to just drill new screws into there when reinstalling the bumper. This is not good. So apparently the previous owners of the Mustang at some point went and did Baja in this thing. Um, I have zero, like, I mean, Jesus Christ. And like the radiator doesn't, it's not standing on anything really, um, or anything that it should be at least. I'm like gonna break. God damn. Hey, it didn't break. Oh no, that broke. This is what working out is supposed to help me do. Why isn't it helping me do this? Come on, come on. It took a lot of coercion and muscle, but I did pry out the bumper from where it had been pinched. Normally, there'd just be a handful of button clips down here. There should be two or three screws in the bumper over the wheel well too, along with one that is in front of the wheel well on each side. You're also going to want to unplug the fog lights as well if you have them. In the tutorial that I'm watching, Chris Fix says that there are hidden bolts, except he kind of doesn't really show exactly where they are. So there's the wheel, and they're like back there. Yeah, 
see. So there's two of those there, and they're on each side. One of the nuts snapped off, but after removing all of the visible clips, screws, and nuts, you run into the final clips, which would usually require just a little bit of wiggling and prying, but it required a lot of finesse with the disgusting, likely due to previous owner's off-road excursion accidents. This actually took so long that I called it a day and started working on the back. We ended up getting it off through prying at the clips underneath the headlight relentlessly. It hopefully wouldn't be like that for you. With the bumper off, remove the styrofoam. You might have to drill out some rivets depending on the car. Then slide out this piece of foam and voila, you have inside access to your own crash bar. First, figure out where to drill. You can test fit it by holding it in place with a magnet and then placing the bumper roughly where it would be. I just drilled where Chris Fix did. I can't stress this enough. Start with small bits and work your way up to the final half inch bit. Use as small increments as possible. Also, drill slow and lubricate your bits. With this out of the way, slide a washer on the bolt, a dab of medium strength thread locker and put it in. Then put a split lock washer on the other side and a nut. Also, make sure that these are at least SAE grade eight or metric 10.9. After tightening the bolt, you're gonna want to test fit it with your styrofoam. Draw on the bolt with a paint marker to show what part of the foam needs got. Then take a large bit and drill the hell out of that area so that your foam sits flush over the bolt and bumper. Then it's a reversal of the bumper takedown. If your foam was riveted in, you can use self-tapping screws or something similar to reattach the foam. Once you have put in all of the clips, screws, and nuts from earlier, plug back in your fog lights and screw back in the top of the bumper. We drilled out a small area for a wall anchor and then drilled some screws in here. Now with your bumper back on, admire your new look, which makes my Mustang look like a dopey dog with its tongue out. Now for the last part, installing the trailer hitch as a rear tow point. Um, we need to take off this stuff. I got my handy little tool popper, or tool popper, button popper. Was so nice. And you're going to have to remove various buttons and screws for this job, many of which were missing on the Mustang. Ah! Ah, oh, that's so dusty. Oh, that. What did they do to you? Oh my. All right, so, see those? It looks like we're analyzing footage of the fucking Titanic, but. You're going to have to remove those two nuts on each side. I popped out the buttons on the underside first and removed the screws on the inside of the fender as well. These buttons were satisfying with the button tool. Hey! Oh shit, <laughs> where the f Then I took care of the nuts holding the sides of the bumper, and then the other nuts and bolts on the front side. I did miss a few though, so I had to come back to those. I got those out. Actually, it wasn't terribly difficult, um, but I lost one of the bolts. Uh, really terrible. Um, this one, this one, this one, this one but I quickly found out that I was still missing a few that were located closer to the taillights on each side, a few of which were covered by a mouse nest. Hold up. So this is uh, what we're dealing with. I just don't want to pull out the body, you know? That's the last thing that I want. Hey, look at all that. It's all that threw away. If I, oh! Chris Fix was like, put this in the grass, you know, and save the paint. 
This bitch is lucky I don't throw it in a fight. I don't even, what was, oh, trailer hitch. <laughs> I'm gonna go wash my hands and and decompress. Now, I went with the trailer hitch route because I didn't want to drill into the bumper. I could also possibly tow a small trailer with track stuff, and honestly, I did it because Chris Fix did it. After installing it, I'd probably say just install a hook, but here's how I did it. You have to take off these two rusty bolts. If you don't know which ones they are, jack up the hitch to the crash bar, and you will figure it out pretty quickly like I did. Removing the bolts took me about 20 minutes because they were quite corroded. Penetrating fluid and leverage are your friend here. With those off, I jacked up the hitch and tried to put the bolts back in. This was also a pain in the ass and took 10 minutes of profanity and an extra hand to get it done. This allows you to mark where you need to drill into the crash bar. As infuriating as it sounds, you're going to want to lower the hitch back down after marking where to drill, or else it gets in the way. I took out the bumper foam through drilling out the two rivets. This gives you access to tighten the nut when you eventually get there. It took a couple hours to drill into this crash bar because we trashed a few drill bits and didn't follow the aforementioned procedure. This crash bar uses very high strength steel, so take it slow and do it right. I used half inch bolts back here with thread locker and the same washer set up as up front. Now, with all four bolts in place, Put back the foam with self-tapping screws if you had rivets like me, and then cautiously reinstall your bumper. With the bumper in place, I found that I couldn't fully put in all of the buttons due to the hitch, but I've driven the car a lot since this and none came out. Guys, this was a longer job than I anticipated. Now, it's all going to cost you a decent amount. In my case, around $650 to pass the tech inspection. So, the tow straps, heat shield, fire extinguisher setup, hitch, and a Snell 2020 rated helmet. One thing I should also mention, Drift Indy also requires a cover over the positive terminal, which can just be electrical tape and you must run distilled water as a coolant. So flush it a few times and fill it up with that. I'm assuming that other drift organizations require similar things. Then I throw in another $200 for an extra set of rear tires and a $135 entrance fee to drift. And now we're looking at a thousand just to show up and be able to perform. That's not to mention the tire mounting, reconditioning, or mechanical fixes you might need as well. I'll go over everything I put into this in a future video, but for now, here's my takeaway. If you buy a car with the intent to drift, congrats. It's a ton of fun and you can definitely do this stuff on your own. Just make sure your savings account can handle it too. While you can definitely meet these safety specifications in a cheaper manner than I did, I'd still make sure that my savings had a grand or two in it at least because you're definitely going to want to start modifying your car after the first time going on the track. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe and I'll catch you in the next one. Fetch me their soul. No.